السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم نحمده ونصلي على رسوله الكريم أما بعد قال الله عز وجل في كتاب العزيز بعد عود بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ما يفعل الله بعذابكم إن شكرتم وآمنتم وكان الله شاكرا عليما Brothers and sisters, one day the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came out of his house. He led Fajr Salah. And after leading Fajr Salah, he turned around and looked at the Sahaba. And he just sat there quietly. And this was not something shocking to the Sahaba because they know at this point in the Prophet's life that most of the time the Prophet would stay quiet. His silence was far more than his speech. He would only speak when he would expect a reward from a statement. So yes, it is not wrong to say that if we study the words of the Prophet ﷺ, we study his actions, we are not going to get his entire life until we know and analyze what he was doing in his silence. Because most of his life he was staying quiet. And it's one of the greatest sunnahs to just stay quiet. A lot, of, a lot of disputes can be resolved by just staying quiet and not snapping back. So the Prophet ﷺ turned around and he's looking at the Sahaba and he didn't say nothing until Ishraq. He prays Ishraq, sits back down, looks at the Sahaba, the Sahaba looking at his beautiful face, the same face that many people saw and accepted Islam immediately after seeing him. لو لم تكن له آية مبينة لكان منظره يأتيك بالخبر حسام بن ثابت used to say that if he never spoke a single word he did not bring a single miracle just by looking at his beautiful face it was enough to accept Islam so he sat there till afternoon right before Dhuhr Salah he smiled he laughed and when Muhaddithin narrated his hadith they actually smiled and laughed because the Prophet did it he smiled until you could see his teeth, the nur from his teeth. Then he led Dhuhr Salah. And then he turned around again. And he sat there till Asr. And I'm going to interject here for a second. Allah through His infinite wisdom created us in this era. Because if we take the same Abdul Rahman, same person, and Allah created me at the time of the Prophet our attention is so limited that if you were to be sitting in front of the Prophet of Allah وسلم, for half an hour, an hour, and he wasn't saying anything, we probably just left. Because even when someone speaks, we can't pay attention for that long. One of my teachers found out that on YouTube, we have two times faster. You know what I'm talking about? And I don't know how this person found out. He doesn't even have a smartphone. When I came to meet him in Benoni Town, he asked me, Abdul Rahman, do you listen to things on this two days ago? Like you press two and it goes faster. And I said, I said, yeah. He says, don't do it. He said, don't do it. I started doing research about this. And he said, this is actually going to mess up your brain. You're always going to want to hear things quicker. Even when, even when my wife speaks, I'm two times faster. <laughs> I wish there was a button. Like just touch your head. Right? That's what people start doing. And then he says something interesting. He said, look at the sunnah of the Prophet Just think about it. If you were sitting in front of the Prophet وسلم, would he be speaking two times faster? Or perhaps maybe 0.75%? Because كَانَ يَتَكَلَّمْ بِالتَّرْدِيلِ وَالْإِنْفَصَالِ He would speak slowly. He would separate each word. A person who's listening to him could literally count the words that he stated. So if we were to sit in front of the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with the same mindset, we'd be like, Na'udhu Billah. So the Prophet Sallallahu was sitting there till Asr, didn't say a word. After Asr, he sat there till Maghrib, didn't say a word. After Maghrib, he sat there till Isha, didn't say a word. Then he was going home and Abu Bakr who followed him. And he asked him, he said, Ya Rasulullah, he didn't ask him why he stayed quiet, because again, that was normal. The Prophet would stay quiet. But he asked him why he smiled. 
Because every gesture of the Prophet of Allah وسلم, was recorded by the greatest students that ever walked on the face of the earth. The Sahaba. They asked these questions. Why did you smile, Ya Rasulullah? The Prophet وسلم, he mentions this long hadith. And I'm going to summarize two, three narrations. And at the end, these are three narrations I'm going to share with you. And all three illustrate one basic fundamental principle of Allah. All three, and this is why the Prophet smiled all three times. What is that basic principle of Allah? Shaykh Yusuf bin Nuri, when someone used to take acceptance in takhassus in fiqh, a specialization in fiqh, very difficult specialization in Binuri town, he would say to these students, he would say in Urdu, but I'll say it in English, he would say to them, you have to try really, 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 really hard to fail. He would say really five times in Urdu. You have to, let me, let me repeat myself. You have to, which college professor or med school professor or someone who's advising you will tell you, you have to try really, 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 really hard to fail. And students will be like, what? Like, actually it's very easy to pass. And then he would say, this is not the principle of this madrasa, this is the principle of Allah. You actually have to try really, really, really hard to fail. Allah will constantly give His servants opportunities after opportunities after opportunities to pass, to succeed. Because Allah loves us. And Umar al Khattab, when he used to recite this verse, he would cry. What benefit will Allah get if He punishes you? As a father, and this is recorded, I hope there's no cops outside, after I say this, as a father, my father-in-law told me two weeks ago that my youngest son, Hussein, is getting very arrogant. He's five years old. He's cute, he's a cute kid. He looks like me. <laughs> His mom thinks it looks like him, her. So anyways, Hussein is five years old. Of course, he's a little kid. And so he's, and the other one is 10, the other one's 12. And I always thought, you know, Yusuf alayhi salam, my brother's favorite surah, it wasn't that the father was always telling Yusuf how cute he was. It was the brothers always had to hear from visitors. Every time they would walk in, oh, what a cute kid. What a cute kid. Brother, like, bro, how about me? Okay, and that develops this, Cycle of entitlement and I'm something. And my son's five years old. And my father-in-law said, he's, he's getting arrogant. So I come home, I've never hit him in my life. Me and I have this very beautiful relationship. I come home, I sit him down, I take a hanger. Right, should I take a hanger? I make him sit in front of me. Wallahi, this kid seeing me angry at him for the first time, with a hanger in my hand, he started crying immediately. But I still hit him. I still hit his hand, like this. He cried for the next three, four hours because he couldn't believe that his father, who he's such good friends with, would hit him. Now you as a mother or father tell me, who do you think was hurt more, the child or me? Of course it was me. I didn't even just, I just tapped him. But he was hurt, he was crying. I wanted to go hug him, kiss him, but I couldn't, I just said, leave him alone. And the whole night I was thinking about it. Now, this is a ridiculous example to illustrate. Do you really think Allah wants to punish us? He loves us. He loves us more than we could ever imagine. Hence, He will always give us opportunities after opportunities. This pathway to paradise. There's no trick questions. The Houston Astros got sanctioned because of one small thing. They figured out the off-speed pitches. They just had a, just because, if you know the pitch that's coming, you can smack it out of the park. That's all they need to know. What pitch is coming? Brothers and sisters, Allah told us every pitch that's coming. Allah told us every pitch of shaitan. He illustrated every single trick of shaitan. He did not leave anything hidden. There's a trick question to trick you into Jahannam. Actually, there are things to trick you into Jannah. 
Do, get, no, do, you, Jannah. Just think about that for a second. This is the Prophet I'm sitting down. And Abu Bakr says, Ya Rasulullah, why'd you laugh? The Prophet he says, can I get this book for a second? Brother Habibi, I know you're writing, but I want this book. The Prophet he says, as I was sitting, the scene unfolded for me on the Day of Judgment that will take place. Sahih Hadith in Abu Dawood. A person will come to Allah and Allah will give him his book of deeds in his left hand. May Allah protect us. Say Ameen. There will be people who will get their book of deeds in their right hand. Some will get it in their left hand and some will get it from behind their backs because they will tie their hands behind their backs. They will refuse to take it. And they will fall on their knees. knees. They will kneel in front of Allah. Allah will then tell the angels, shove the book in their, book in their hands. And it will be behind their back like this. Allah protect us. So this person will get his book of deeds in his left hand. Allah will say, Iqra kitabak. He will start reading. He will see nothing but sins, not even one good deed. Every single page will be full of sins. Allah will ask this person two questions. Did the angels who recorded your deeds, did they do any dhulm upon you? Did they, did they record something that wasn't yours? This person will say, La Ya Rab, this, this, is my, this is my book. It says my name all over it. Allah will then ask, are there any sins that are not recorded? He will say, لا يغادر صغير ولا كبير إلا حصاها. Every minor, major sin is recorded, even the ones I forgot about, I was reminded now. Allah, because He loves this person so much, He will instantly tell the book of deeds, transform all the sins into good deeds. This person will start reading the same book he was reading a few seconds ago. And every single page that was full of sins is now full of good deeds. When he gets to the last page, he'll say, Oh Allah, if there's 100 pages of sins, now there are 100 pages of good deeds. He'll say, Oh Allah, there were some sins that are not in this book. <laughs> He's trying to hustle God. He's probably some Daisy, you know, Maimon. <laughs> trying to get one more, one more last one. He said, Oh Allah. There are some sins. Allah already asked him. This is why the prophets are laughing. That Allah told you to go to Jannah, go. Then the Prophet says, Allah, brother here, you can write this later now, okay? Allah, give him a round of applause. Allah will then tell the angels as everyone goes to Jannah and Jahannam, Allah will say, you know like a mother who leaves the hotel room and then checks to make sure nothing is left. Us guys are already in the car, looking for the coffee place. While our mothers are like, oh, one last thing. I mean, if you're a desi auntie, you're picking up the lotions too. <laughs> Don't tell me you haven't done that. Picking up the lotions and the soaps and this and that, and putting your bag. My mom has it from 10 years. It's halal. So you, here's, you're, you're just making sure everything, the person is downstairs, like we're downstairs, but the mother is making sure everything is picked up. Anything left, maybe my child's toy, maybe my, my child's socks. Allah will tell the angels, go check Jahannam and see if there's anyone left. Go check. Hadith of Abu Dawood. One of the six Sahih books. Angels will go and say, no, no one's left. Allah will say, no, 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 go ask people. Go ask them, did they do any good deeds? Wallahi, this is something that will happen in Qiyamah. There is not a single page in the Quran that does not have the fragrance of Qiyamah and Akhirah on it. That's the biggest thing that's spoken about in the Quran, the belief in Akhirah. Oh Allah, I ask for such conviction that makes it easy for me to go through the problems of this world. The Prophet would make this dua all the time. The angels will go back and they will start questioning people. Hey bro, did you do anything good? No. Did you do anything good? They're not going to say bro, but you know, did you do anything good? No. They'll ask him, did you do anything good? He said, no, I, no come on, think about it. 
Yeah. Now they have to go back to Allah. Think about it. Did, did, you, and did you ever do anything good? Did anyone say anything good about you? So this one fellow will say, people used to praise me about kuntu usamihu fil bay'ah. People would praise me that I'm easy going in my business dealings. What does that even mean, easy going in business dealings? Meaning like, you go to a restaurant, you know, the guy who the owner is, like he, he, you, he charges you full for the, for the food because, you know, sometimes I go to restaurants in Detroit, you know, people know us there. They go, I'm not gonna say any names right now. You go to a restaurant, $84.36. Sheikh, since you're here, I'll give you a discount. $83.48. <laughs> A dollar. I'm like, bro, just give me the whole, right? Like, like they'll make sure that me know. Just for you, Sheikh. Not that type of discount. Like, the Usamih fil bayt means you get, you, I'm giving you an example of a restaurant. You got your food, you paid for it, you sat down, but the person, the owner of the restaurant recognizes that these are guests, there's extra people here. You go to the refrigerator, get some drinks, and then you go back and say, could you please? He's like, no, no, it's okay. The drink's on me. This is actually called Usamih fil bayt a little easy going, it's okay, I'll give you that. Right? You, a handyman's doing some work and then they saw some extra thing that needs to be done, he just did that. Usually the opposite happens. Right? This is called Usam Mihfil Bayt. Just the ease. He said, people used to praise me because I was easy going in my dealings, I used to let things go. Allah will tell the angels, take him out of the fire of Jahannam. He used to be easy going with my servants, today I'll be easy going with him. Last person. Angel, did you do anything good? He said, no. He would literally say, even the end of my life was horrible. We're going to be judged by the way we die. He says, even the end of my life was horrible. Angel, what did you do at the end of your life? He will say, I got, my, I got my kids together. I told them I'm a horrible person. So when I die, make sure you burn me and take my ashes and throw it in all the different bodies of water and he made the statement Allah will never be able to resurrect me this is how he died Allah will say to him but why did you do this? what made you do this? he would say Mim makhafatik oh Allah I was embarrassed to stand in front of you I was embarrassed you know, like when you go, I took someone from Michigan with us to Masjid Nabui to say salam to the Prophet ﷺ. First time he went in his life, and he had a very, like he had a business that was haram dealings in, in Michigan. He gets there, we get to the door, and we're all excited to go inside, and he stops. He doesn't go inside. I say, come, come, he stops. I go say salam, go to, the, go to the hotel. I ask him, why don't you say salam? You just came to the masjid all the way here, and you never walked into the masjid. This is like de deprivation. You didn't even walk into the masjid. He said, Wallahi, I was embarrassed to show my face to the Prophet ﷺ. What face was I going to show them to the Prophet ﷺ? Tu ghani azhardu alam man faqeer. Roza mahshid uzr hai man pazeer. Gardu mi bini hisab amna guzeer. Az nagahe mustafa bin ha pagheer. Allah Iqbali says, Oh Allah, you are so independent and I'm so dependent. On the day of judgment, please don't stop me and question me. Let me just slide. You don't need to ask me anything. Let me go through. But I have two requests. If you decide to do my hisab, of course I can't question you. You can do whatever you want. Don't do my hisab anywhere near the Prophet I don't want to disappoint him. When Ahmad bin Hanbal was forgiving the oppressors, he said, why do you forgive them and make dua for them? He said, because of two things. I don't want that because of me, a believer's entrance is delayed into Jannah. Number one. Number two, أَوْ أَسُوءَ مُحَمَّدًا فِي أُمَّتِهِ Or that I cause any difficulty to the Prophet in terms of his ummah. Because the Prophet ﷺ will be going around on the Day of Judgment asking Allah to forgive those who are sinners. I don't want to be the one who the Prophet was doing that in dunya, and because of me, he's doing that in Akhirah. I don't want me, I don't want to be the reason his entrance into Jannah is delayed. That he's helping somebody out. I forgive them. He said, well, Allah, do not do my hisab in front of the Prophet. ﷺ. So this person is saying, Mimma khafatik, ya Rabb, I was embarrassed. I messed up. Allah will say, You had this beautiful quality. Oh, angels, take him out of Jahannam and put him into Jannah. Allah is looking for opportunities. 
a pathway to paradise, every salah, every dhikr, every good deed we do, and every Ramadan that we are able to enjoy, these are all different opportunities to get to Jannah. Don't for, for a second ever think that Allah is making it difficult. Actually, we have to try really, 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 really hard to fail because Allah has made it very easy. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa